Hi, this is my sincere privilege to be sharing the Word of God with you. There's a beautiful story that we all know and I think may have read and sometimes with a bit of a puzzled go away, not really maybe fully understanding this story. And this is, of course, the story of the Gentile who shares her faith. The story begins where, in context, the Jews are apprehensive of this Jesus rabbi who is calling himself the Messiah. They are really struggling to believe that he's the one. And we've been reading through countless different encounters where they are questioning him and trying to figure out his legitimacy. The, in, in the pursuit of trying to catch Jesus off guard, they come with a question about the washing rituals. And as you know, the Jews can really go far with all the rituals that they have, and particularly the, the rituals of hand washing. And so they come with an accusation. Why is Jesus, his disciples, not following the rites of the Jews by doing all the prescribed, prescribed washings necessary? Religion does that. 2 Timothy 3.5 says that some have the outward appearance of godliness, but they lack the power. If washing of hands would help you to become more holy, become a better husband, be a better father, become a better person, bear more fruit of the Spirit, be more godly, well, be praying for the sick and healing the sick and deliver people from evil, well, go ahead, wash your hands. The thing is that washing hands makes you look pious and religious, and some people glory in that. But the hearts, that's the real problem. And that's what Jesus is dealing with, is the impurity of their hearts. And that's the preceding passage before we come to the Gentiles sharing her faith, is Jesus accuses them. and says, but it's not what you eat, it's not what you, you take on or what you touch that makes you unclean. It's what comes from the heart. It's from the evil thoughts in your heart that evil proceeds. Then Jesus hides away. And it's the first passage or first story where Jesus actually moved out of Palestine, moved out of the Judean era, where the Jews and their faith are still practice as the public faith and obviously the Romans allows that although this is a, a war territory or warlike uh, occupied territory by the Romans they allow religious freedom and they allowed the Jews to continue with their religious faith but now Jesus wants to hide away it's almost like he wants to take a breather of this accusations and onslaught of the unbelief of the pastors and the 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 script the, the the teachers of the day so here we come and jesus moves in the unclean territory so he moves into that area where the jews consider these people as totally unclean and they are the gentiles Greco Romans, and if you read in Afrikaans translations, you actually read where Matthew refers to to her in in the Canaan uh, reference that she's descendants from the Canaanites, and remember that was the great Jewish battle that the Jews had to to conquer and to receive their own sovereignty by taking the land of the Canaanites. Mark, who has a similar passage that you'll find in, in Mark 7, uh, refers to her as a Syrophoenician woman, meaning she's from the Greco-Roman era. And to put it in modern terms, it's like a hillbilly going to New York. Uh, suddenly, Jesus is in a different center of where Judaism is very scarce. This is Gentile territory. And yet, by the Facebook of the day, the rumors and news that Jesus is in the area uh, reached this woman. And out of desperation, she came to minister to him or ask him for her help. And interesting, if you read with me in Matthew, Matthew 15, verse 21, and then Jesus went out from these and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon, which is now this gentle area. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, 
son of David. Now, what is interesting here is the Jews are struggling to believe that Jesus is a son of David. They're trying to figure out his genealogy. Are you not the son of Joseph? Are you not of the carpenter's descent? Uh, trying to figure out this woman who is unclean makes a by faith proclamation by the moment she greets him by saying, Lord, meaning Lord. She respects him as the one, the curious, as the, as the Greek word there. And she acknowledged that he's the son of David, the Messiah, by definition. Have mercy on me, Lord. And, and then she says about her daughter, who is severely demon-possessed. If you ever had a child, if you have a child where some sickness or some addiction has taken hold of your child, there's nothing that uh, lames, maims, that horrifies a parent so much as to have to deal with with this unknown, maybe she had been to different doctors and different priests in her own faith, and they couldn't help. And so, pure desperation is bringing her to Jesus. Now, interestingly, Jesus gives her a deaf ear. He doesn't hear, doesn't want to listen, doesn't give her any attention. This is most unloving. And the translation really, if you go read the passage in Mark as well, is Jesus is just totally ignoring her, doesn't listen at all. And finally, when she proskuneos, the Greek word where we get our word prostrate from, falls in front of his feet, hold on to him, I have kissed his feet, saying again, Lord, help me. He then furthermore, unlovingly, make this statement, you should not take the food from the children and give it to the house dogs, the house pets. <laughs> now, I've come for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, uh, this term, the derogatory term about uh, you being a dog, is, is, is it's hard, it's harsh, isn't it? But this was a religious term that the Jews would often use, as you would get today in some Muslim cultures, that they would refer to Christians or those of not of the Muslim faith as infidels, and the same, they dogs, they outcasts. And the Jews had the same stance on these Greco-Roman heathens by saying, you dogs, you, 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 you're nothing to partake of God's grace. Jesus softens a little bit by using the Greek word for house pets or house dogs. So, in a way, giving and opening a little bit of the door to her to say, well, you were allowed in, but uh, your preference or the desire you want is not what I'm here for. And then a wonderful exclamation, the change of the story. She says, Lord, I agree. I acknowledge that. But remember that the dogs, they do eat from the crumbs that falls from the table. And this statement is what Jesus then turns to her. And he changes his whole stance towards her. And he says, woman, kume, now using a respectful term for her, a adult woman or a senior woman, making that reference. And he says, your logos, your word, and then remember the word logos means intelligent understanding of reason of the word. So he says, your reasoning, your intelligent reasoning of understanding the scripture is remarkable. And then he says, I've not seen this mega, that's a Greek word there, uh, faith, great faith, mega faith. Wow. Now this, stand, uh, this whole passage doesn't stand in harsh contrast to the previous passage where Jesus was talking to the Jews for which he came. He did all these miracles and signs and wonders, and yet they couldn't believe. They couldn't accept. They couldn't come to the terms that maybe he is the one. Now, you see, here's the biggest problem that we all have facing life. It says in, in Matthew 28, and you can go read, where it says the disciples worshipped him. They, they worshipped him, and then yet, the scripture says, some doubted. 
Now, that's the problem, isn't it? Is that we as Christians, sometimes we do come and we stand in churches and we praise God and we put up the facade of we okay and we sing the songs we ought to sing. But there is a seed of doubt in our hearts. So, this passage really teaches us that it's not a measure of your faith, meaning how hard you try to believe that determines the size of your faith. It's the presence of doubt. If, you, if there's no doubt, great faith. If there's a lot of doubt, small faith. See, it's a hard thing. It's an unclean thing. Now, we know that doubt is a satanic attack. It's okay to, to sometimes doubt, to wonder, to, to have questions about your faith and, and try to reason it out. But you see, did God really say was the seed of doubt that came from, from the devil, the snake, and tempted Adam and Eve to forsake their birthright and their eternal inheritance? This is... This woman had the opposite. She had childlike, absolute faith, meaning she's not giving up, although she's getting an ignore and no, uh, she's not getting uh, seemingly that Jesus is open to help her. And yet, she simply and straightforwardly, determinedly believe and not holding or not giving up, he's the solution. You see, to become a Christian is ultimately to come to the place where you reject all the alternatives. You follow the alternatives. You try it, you may have, but you come to a place where you now realize, I, I have one solution. There's one hope. There's, there's one person I look at, and that's God. I've been at the doctors. And this is a great lesson of faith, isn't it, for us, that our solution is not in a paycheck or in a person or in government or in some high person or someone who has power or whatever to help me. My faith is simply childlike, directed to God alone. And when this woman proskuneo, when she literally lay down and humbled herself, she may have been, you know, being a Roman Greco woman, she may have been well dressed, and we don't know if she comes from maybe a higher society or something, but for her to fall prostrate, flat on the floor, and and holding on to Jesus, said, Lord, help me. And then, <laughs> by doing that, still getting this theological religious answer. Don't take the food of the dogs or from the children. And derogatory, small pet dogs, I mean, that's harsh, that's offensive. But she didn't take offense. She persevered, and then she displayed this unwavering faith that she says, Lord, we're still eating from the crumbs. I'm holding on. I believe that you're going to heal my, my daughter. I know you're going to do good. I know who you are. <laughs> she held on to who God is. She's not literate as the Pharisees were. She's not a scholar. She's not versed in all the traditions of the law and Judaism and so forth. And yet she had a simple, childlike faith in God. And here's the remarkable, a remarkable testimony. Jesus says, woman, without saying a word, without preaching, praying, declaring, doing nothing, literally just says, woman, your daughter is healed. So it means that the moment she declared faith, the moment Jesus acknowledged her faith, that moment the miracle happened. God delivered her daughter of the unclean spirit. I want to look you in the eye as I... I have to look myself in the eye, that all of us sometimes have an unclean thought in the sense of doubt, which is an unclean thing. It's not from God. God is not an author of doubt. He's not the one that puts those thoughts there. It's satanic. And all of us have been through disappointments, and surely through hardship and difficulty, we all begin to wonder, where is God? And sometimes getting a no things didn't work out the way we believe it would. We become offended at God, become offended at His 
seemingly ignoring our plight, what we need. Well, this woman, <laughs> she just held through all of that, and she believed. She, in a simple way, believed that God can do it. And Jesus looked at her, this Gentile of an unclean background, by the Jews, considered unclean. Jesus says, you have mega faith, <laughs> more than all these Pharisees and Jews and the tribe of, of the, the Judaism for which I've come for, tribe of Israel. More than all those, you've displayed faith. And that's what you and I need to come to God, is childlike faith. You see, to love God, to all of us have to love something for our existence, for us to, to have a normal life. We, we cherish someone, we live for someone. We all need to be loved. All the world needs is love. Eventually, if we love a person or we love an institution or something, we have the harsh reality to be disappointed. And the same also when we put our trust in God. He's not a belief, he's not a philosophy, he's a person. And sometimes he says no, sometimes he does things that we do not understand. But this childlike love, this childlike belief and trust in him, regardless, that's what we all need so that we can unlock heaven on earth in our situations. You see, when Jesus said to her, you have logos, this words that you spoke intelligently, he was saying and acknowledging that she's thinking as God thinks. She's beginning to come into the sphere of faith, and the sphere of faith is intelligent. The same happened when Jesus healed the, the man who was demon-possessed, that after he's been freed from all these demons, he was in his right mind. You see, faith is being in your right mind. Uh, faith, true faith, is intelligence. It's through faith in the eyes of faith that we look at our circumstances with hope. We look at our lives and all that we're busy with, with hope, with, with an expectation that God is good and He will turn all this negative into a positive. And it was this faith, this great mega faith that brought the reality of kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven right there for her and the child got freed and delivered and so god also wants to set me and you free from from any doubts that may have persisted in our hearts where we were questioning we're not understanding god's sovereignty we don't understand that he's maybe only called to the jews or there's a particular plan that he has she understood that Yet, she held on to God's goodness and who God really is, and that God can do the impossible. And I want to prophesy into your life to say that God, the God of the impossible, can also change your circumstances in a moment when you, in childlike faith, bring yourself, bring your heart, bring your whole being and essence to Him. It may cost you to repent like I have to, to repent of any doubt that may have crept into our hearts, to just face it head on and say, God, forgive me. And then that proskuneo, that throwing down of all your high thoughts and high ideas and literally laying before him. Maybe that's what you physically also need to do. And then in that moment, faith comes. Faith is a gift that comes from the presence of God. Faith is something that manifests when we're in the presence of God. We can't be with God and experience God and see God without the eyes of faith. And this joy in believing was that brought the final breakthrough. She had like a, a happy, you know, although she was laying down and desperate, it was something joyful about this. There was something, maybe joyful is the wrong word, but there's, you see, when we see God in the Spirit as smiling on us. And although at that moment she didn't perceive a smile, she was getting an ignore, she was getting a harsh statement, she, she saw a smile. And I can, I can almost imagine that after Jesus, you know, after she declared this statement, he, he smiled. 
I, I can just just go through the story. <laughs> he looked at her and he went, wow. <laughs> this woman, you know, she's different. She she has a lot to complain about, but her faith ignites that that joyful expectation. You know, when lovers walk in the street, you see that smile. You see it in the, the, the step, the energy in that step. You see it in the little spark in the eyes. And this is what she had. She had the spark of faith to believe in him that he can do the impossible. Maybe you are facing impossibility, things that is just beyond what you can think or understand or reason or yeah, you've tried your best. Well, may this story inspire you to know that there's more than survival. There's more and beyond just making it day by day. That if we really take God on His Word, if we really hang on to Him as Old Testament Jacob did, we says, Lord, I'm not going to leave you until you bless me. And that persistence to hold on to Him, hold on to Him, brought a breakthrough. And my prayer for you is that that breakthrough will be close and imminent for you when you come to Jesus the same way that this Gentile woman did. May God bless you. And may he bless this word in your heart, in Jesus' name. Amen.